I'm here today as a speaker for the bugs. I'm actually a microbial ecologist, and I'm a PhD, so I'm not a real doctor. <laughs> but I am here today on behalf of your microbiota. I find it really incredible that the amount of research that has been done in the past many decades in the field of medicine has completely ignored over half of our bodies. What do I mean by that? What I mean is that this, consider this. Everyone in this room probably would like to, <laughs> would like to think that they're human, correct? <laughs> but I'm going to blow your mind now. I'm going to say to you that actually, in terms of the microbes that live on you and in you, by cell numbers alone, you're actually more microbial than you are human. There are 10 times more microbes living on you and in you than there are human cells in your body. And perhaps even more amazing than that, there are 100 times more microbial genes that live, uh, that, that are to do with those microbes in your body than there are human genes. So we're a lot more microbial than we are human. And yet, when we think of the word bacteria, if I was to do a word association with you, I think that most of you would say, if I said bacteria, you'd say disease. Correct? And that is kind of stunning to me, because most of the research that has been done in the field of microbial ecology, in the field of medicine, has been focused on the pathogens, the ones that cause disease. And that's a very, very small percentage of the bacteria that live on us and in us. And yet we call that health research which is ironic because we really don't know what health is. Now, I have focused my research career as a microbial ecologist in the area of the human gut. Now, I've got friends who are microbial ecologists who go to the uh, to sample the coastal waters off Hawaii, and I have other friends who sample the soil in the jungles of Costa Rica. <laughs> and my work is done in the smallest room in the house. So you might ask me why. <laughs> why would I choose to do my field work in our backyard, as it were, instead of somewhere really exotic in Costa Rica or Hawaii? Well, I've always been fascinated by the microbial ecology of the human gut. And the reason for that is because, apart from the fact that it's been ignored for many decades until fairly recently, the reason for that is something that, that really sort of um, piqued my interest when I first started to, to, to learn in this area. And that is the fact that every single one of you has a unique microbiota in their guts that is unique to them, a little bit like a fingerprint. Now, you have uh, about 500 to 1,000 different bacterial species of microbes living in your gut. It's unique to you. We call it a poo print. <laughs> and that poo print, made up of those microbes, is about three pounds worth of microbes living in your gut in weight, so that's quite a lot. I wouldn't suggest that you try to purge yourself of them to lose weight because you need them, as you'll see in a minute. That poo print will stay with you for life from the time of when you start weaning, when you start introducing solid foods, when you're a child, to the time of your death. Those microbes will be the same microbes, more or less. And we don't have any idea how that can be the case. And I find that absolutely amazing and incredible. And so I've been wanting to do research in this area ever since. Now, the trouble is, probably the reason why so, much, uh, so little research has been done in this area is because the microbes that live in the human gut are very, very difficult to grow. They're very picky, they're very fussy. They uh, eat certain types of food that are very specific to them. They like to be with their friends. They're very social beings. They don't like to uh, be grown on their own, which is the traditional way that microbiologists grow microbes. Most of them find oxygen toxic, so the air that we breathe is toxic to them and will kill them very quickly. So how do we grow and how do we study these microbes in the laboratory? Well, what I've done is I have 
uh, started to, in, in my lab at Guelph, started to look at the microbes as a collection, as an ecosystem, rather than the traditional way of looking at them, uh, taking them apart in a reductionist way. So to do that, we have this piece of equipment here on the screen that looks like a very complicated piece of equipment. Uh, uh, it's a lot of tubing, a lot of uh, wiring, uh, a lot of metal and glass. Uh, the business end, as it were, is uh, here. <laughs> and in here, we, uh, we have some very uh, generous donors who, uh, yeah, you know who you are, <laughs> yeah. who, who come to our lab and very freshly donate us some samples of poop, which we process in an anaerobic chamber to keep it free of oxygen and put into this machine. And you can think of this machine as a little bit like a life support system for those microbes, a life support system for your microbiota, or your symbionts, which is the word that we use to describe a, 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 life, a life form inside us, something that depends on us, and, and we actually depend on it, our symbionts. So I've spent an awful lot of time using this piece of equipment to look and to study these microbes, and I feel a little bit of a communion with them. And I feel compelled today to speak to you on their behalf. Now, I realize that for most of you here who are not microbiologists, that you don't see this world. It's invisible to you. So the message that I'm going to try and convey to you is going to be very difficult to understand if you can't see who's saying it. So what I've done is I've had a few of our gut microbial friend representatives pose for you under the electron microscope. And as I speak, the, they're going to cycle behind me so you can see them. So you can see these microbes that are trying to explain and trying to have a voice today. Please listen. If your microbes could speak, they would want to tell you three things. The first thing that the microbes would like you to do is to recognize them. Now, I've already told you about all of these microbes in our guts, and maybe some of you are aware that they're there, but maybe some of you aren't but it's a little bit more than realizing that they're there. It's realizing what they do for us. Your microbes do as much work for you as your average liver. They're a vital organ. They process foods that cannot otherwise be eaten. They provide molecules, beneficial molecules, which help you survive, vitamins, for example. They educate your immune system so that you can respond appropriately to different threats. And they exclude pathogens. These disease-causing organisms are excluded because your gut microbiota is there looking after you. So if your microbes are doing as much work for you as the average liver, we all believe, hopefully, that our liver is a vital organ, we should start to consider our gut, micro, our gut microbiota as a vital organ. Number two, excuse the pun, <laughs> it kind of writes itself. <laughs> Number two is that your gut microbiota would like you to sustain them. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, the food that your gut microbiota eats is the food that we cannot digest ourselves. This would be, for the most part, fiber. And the Western diet is very low in fiber, and uh, probably one of the lowest fiber diets in the world. We eat so much refined food that we find it very difficult to assimilate enough fiber in our diets. And it can be very, very difficult to remember to eat your five fruits and vegetables a day. Maybe it would make it a bit easier for you if you imagine that you have trillions of organisms living in your gut relying on you to do just that. Now, just in the same way that a starving army cannot fight a battle and cannot defend a country, a starving microbiota cannot help you survive, cannot help you to health. So think about that a little bit more. Number three, the third and final thing that your microbes would like you to do is to safeguard them. Microbes colonize or start to colonize your gut from the moment of birth. Babies are born sterile. 
Now, there's a very good reason that the exit to the birth canal is right next to the exit to the gut. And there's a very good reason that babies who are born naturally by vaginal delivery are born face down with their mouths open. And yet, we tend to uh, interfere with this process probably far more than we should. And babies that are born by cesarean section, for example, we now know that they become colonized with microbes that are quite different from the microbes that, are colonized, that colonize a vaginally delivered baby. We don't know the consequences of that, but there may be risks involved, particularly for some uh, babies that seem to be, who are born by C-section, who seem to be at a greater risk of asthma, allergy, atopy. Going on through life, small children, if you notice, like to pick things up and put things in their mouths a lot. And we think that that's a tactile response. It probably is. They're exploring their environment. But I think it might be because they are sampling their environment for microbes. That's going to help them through life. So perhaps we shouldn't be interfering with that process. And we shouldn't be interfering with that by putting um, antimicrobial uh, substances into their toys. Perhaps we shouldn't wash all the environment that they live in quite so carefully. Perhaps we should let them play outside a little bit more. Going on through life, the next stage that is critical for your microbes, or the thing that they would like you to realize, is antibiotic use has its consequences on them as well. Now, antibiotics are vital, life-saving drugs, and I am not suggesting that we stop taking antibiotics. And your gut microbes would not suggest that either. Because they are your symbionts. And if their host dies, they die too. So antibiotics, when used correctly, are a vital, a vital uh, part of medicine and should be respected. But every time you take an antibiotic, your microbes suffer for it. And your microbes would just like you to know that we need to steward the use of antimicrobials. And what does that mean? It means that we should use them only when we need to, only when they are prescribed by a physician, who real doctors know what they're doing, <laughs> and only um, for the conditions that they are prescribed for. Perhaps we should think a little bit carefully about putting them in the environment, in the foods that we eat, in the, uh, the, the water that we drink. Now, the consequences of having a microbiota that is damaged go quite far, and we're just beginning to realize that now. We've now seen an association of many diseases with an, ab an abnormal gut microbiota, from allergy to asthma to autism to depression and several others that may be quite surprising to some of you. So your gut microbes have a suggestion. Your gut microbes would like to invent or create a new medical specialty. And we'll call that medical specialty symbiontology. And in symbiontology, physicians will be taught to recognize, to sustain, and to safeguard your gut microbes. So my name is Amaral Verko, and I've been speaking here today on behalf of your gut microbes. Thank you for listening.